All right, so welcome back to the Fire in the Desert. I'm myself, Johnny, and Pat, how are you going? Yeah, doing pretty good, Johnny. All right. Now, nuclear power is not clean and green, as the industry claims, because large amounts of traditional fossil fuels are required to mine and refine the uranium needed to run nuclear power reactors, to construct the massive concrete reactor buildings, and to transport and store the toxic radioactive waste created by the nuclear process. Burning of these fossil fuels emits significant quantities of carbon dioxide, the primary greenhouse gas, into the atmosphere. In addition, large amounts of the now banned chlorofluorocarbon gas, CFC, are emitted during the enrichment of uranium. CFC gas is not only 10,000 to 20,000 more efficient as an atmospheric heat trapper than CO2, but it is a classic pollutant and a potent destroyer of the ozone layer. And that's from Nuclear Is Not The Answer by Dr. Helen Caldicott. Uh, so have you heard of uh, this lady before? No, I haven't. Okay, no. so she's an Australian. Uh, when you think of doctor when she's writing this book, what kind of doctor do you think she is? Probably nuclear physicist as a, as a stab at the dark. No, uh, I think she is a pediat pediatrician. Pediatrician? Yeah. Okay, that's... <laughs> Not what I was going for. Okay, never no, mind. But uh, eh, yeah. wrong answer. Yep. But here she's saying it's not clean and green. Well, what do you mean green? I, I'm not really sure. But there's all these to create nuclear power. You need to have an input of fossil fuels, and these want to emit CO2. And there's also greenhouse gases like CFC, which are emitted during enrichment, and these will destroy the environment. That's what she's saying. All right. You know, I thought I breathed out CO2 as well. Mm. I, I thought like in, in high school biology, we, like humans, breathe in oxygen, nitrogen, all that yeah. stuff, and it yeah. emits CO2. Yeah, that's right. But plants eat CO2. Yeah, so it's, I, think, I, think at, I think at the heart of the issue is that we're producing more CO2, or the, the argument is that we're producing more CO2 than the plants can cope with, essentially, that they can, well, what is it? Uh, Photosynthesis, I think, was the old, was the... Oh, yeah, gosh, this is, going back, this is going back to grade school. I, taking science. CO2, taking the sunlight energy and yeah. then using the chlorophyll. Some, someone is going to listen to this and go, <laughs> no, he's wrong, he doesn't know his science. I have, I have not tackled my science textbook in quite a number of years, but... Yeah. Um, but we're carbon-based like, carbon life forms. Yeah, so. exactly, yeah. But you t the plants would take in the CO2 and they produce back oxygen. It's the cycle that goes around. CO2 inherently is part of our cycle. It keeps the world spinning, pretty mm. much. But the problem, I think, that people are, are tapping into is that we're, as humans, we're producing more CO2 than we can, than the Earth cycle can actually cope with. Yeah. Uh, but so, but that, here, again, that's yeah. the argument, at least. But, but here, what she's saying is that uh, nuclear power often is advertising itself as clean and green because yeah, there's no CO2. Cleaner but alternative she, to coal, for example. Yeah, but the the mining the enrichment mm. the those processes take up fossil fuels as well of course yeah so it's Car not carbon totally, footprint yeah so it's not totally green that's what she's saying yeah okay here's another one mm. personally i'm against nuclear power but according to the ipcc the united nations intergovernmental panel on climate change it can be a small part of a very big new carbon free energy solution especially in countries and areas that lack the possibility of a full-scale renewable energy supply. Okay. Even though it's extremely dangerous, expensive, and time-consuming. But let's leave that debate until we start looking at the full picture. And that's Greta Thornburg, founder of the, the Youth Climate Strike. Right. Okay. I'm not sure if she actually wrote that, but... Well, maybe she spoke it. She, she, she did speak that, <laughs> but it's like, you know, give a script writer. Well, here she's saying, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, nuclear power is, she's personally against it, mm. but she thinks, or well, what she's, she's saying here is that it can be part of the solution of carbon free. Okay. So, so it's not a no, like it's not zero st st stamping your foot on the ground going no nuclear, bad nuclear. It's yeah. okay. It's not the best solution that we have. There might be other solutions out there, but if there, if we're in a position where we've got nothing, no other option, but nuclear. In this scenario, it might be used to work, mm. something like that. And why is she against it? Well, she says it's extremely dangerous, yep. expensive, and time-consuming. Okay. You know, I thought all sorts of energy production is also dangerous, expensive, and time-consuming. Yeah. 
But I think here it's, there's a relative scale. Like nuclear, we think of bombs and oh, of Chernobyls and Fukushima. That's because we've had about oh, about three, three or four decades of media talking about the horrors of nuclear war. World War Three is right around the corner. The Cold so, War, yeah. yeah. It's it's been hyped. This technology has been hyped up to an unbelievable state of hysteria and paranoia. It's very difficult to have a uh, very clear, decisive argument as to, okay, what are the cold hard facts? How can we get rid of the thought in, your back, in the back of the head of, oh, nuclear bomb, uh, mushroom clouds? Yeah, that, that's really hard. Okay, so let me just ask you, mm. what's your understanding of nuclear energy? Probably a bit of an open question there. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, what do you think the average Australian thinks about nuclear energy? Probably say it's a it's a it's a source of energy that we can use as part of our arsenal. Part of very bad choice of word. Let's not do that. <laughs> oh gosh, this is the fun bit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like okay, let's li let's let's listen to this and take sound bites, and then we can. Yeah, I'll leave in arsenal. Sounds pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, so nuclear energy. It's part. It's a source of energy. It's part of our arsenal of um of our energy supply of how we can power all the different things that we take for granted in our society, electricity primarily. It's probably, a, I would argue, a cleaner version or a more effective version than coal. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the science behind it to say whether we should go full nuclear or, or what, what part of the pie that nuclear should play when you t uh, tie it together with, what would you call it, uh, coal, pa coal fire power stations or solar or wind or hydro. Like, what's the, what's the right ratio? I think that's where the question really comes down to, mm. not whether we should be banning one form of energy output or accepting of others. It's more what's the mix, what's the ratio. All right, so let me just ask you, would you support building a nuclear power plant? I'd probably say yes, yeah. but I'd add the proviso that I, would, I personally don't have, I'm not an expert, I'm not a nuclear physicist. I, I would need to know, either need to know or research myself before making the hard and fast stance, I need to know more. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. If, so, I was put, so if I was put in charge of policy, for example. Open to it, but mm. I need more information. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't, you, it's a very poor state to be in if you start spouting opinions and you don't have all the facts or you, you think you might have some of the facts, but you need, to, if you're going to make policy positions or important decisions, you need to have all the facts uh, in, on the table in front of you. All right, so, so what points would you say you're hesitant on? So what yeah. would make you hesitant sure. in, a nuclear power, in building a nuclear power plant? Yeah. Probably if we're going to be building a new power plant, I want to make sure that it is, um, that it is capable of producing good value on return. So if I'm investing money in it, I want to make sure that I'm able to get a good return on that investment. So it's, it's not a waste. I also want to make sure that it would be safe as well. I know that there's been a number of nuclear power stations, very um, very prominent nuclear power stations that have obviously had a number of accidents and uh, explosions and damage. Uh, Chernobyl, for example, or, or I think it's Fukushima. Is that what Fukushima, in Japan? Yeah, there's, Chernobyl. There's, there's, there've, 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 there've been there have been several, uh, which obviously opens the door for a bit of concern. So so it's the safety, it's the cost, and also making sure that it is. We've already got a form of, or we've already got a form of power station in, in the regard of coal fire power plants. We want to make sure that if we're going to be invent, creating a new type of technology, it's going to be, it's not going to have as a, ne a negative impact, more of a ne negative impact than what we've already got. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that sounds Those are probably key three areas I'd probably yes. look into. So safety, security. And um, effectiveness. And effective. Yeah. Efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We'll try and shape into some of the problems uh, that people will try to throw up when they hmm. uh, talk about nuclear power. Yeah. So first of all, the nuclear scare. So, you know, in terms of weaponry, you know, we talk about enrichment. We heard, hear a lot about the news about Iranians enriching uranium to mm. make nuclear weapons. So basically what it is, is the, the fissile material. So material that is easily fission. So they will give you the fission process. Sure. So you split the atom, the energy yeah. comes out when you yeah. split the atom. And what happens is that we take natural uranium, mm. which is 
99.7% uranium-235 and 99.3% uranium-238. So what you want is the uranium-235. Mm. And you take most of the oxide, or most of the ores around here is only uranium-238. Okay. And to make it reactor grade, so good for nuclear reactors and power plants, sure. you need to enrich that process, increase that um, percentage from 0.7% to 3 to 5%. Okay. Weapons grade is 90%. Right. So just because you have nuclear reactor uranium yep. doesn't mean it'll automatically turn into a bomb. Right. Got it. So an interesting point there is how difficult is it? to increase is it the uh the efficiency the gra the grade so that the enriched the enrichment thank you of the uranium so, so how, how difficult is it to get say from one percent to two percent or in this case 0 0.7 to five percent so what What's they talk the is there? the enrichment um they put in centrifuges okay so what they have is they put the they turn into gas okay right so they take, mix it with fluoride so you get uranium fluoride sure and then you have heavier atoms uh, on the outside and lighter atoms on the inside so uranium-235 is on the center while uranium-238 is on the outside mm. and then the outside bits are put out to waste yeah or made into depleted uranium sure so how how do you differentiate between during the enrichment process mm. between reactor purpose or weapon weaponization post process it's mm. It depends on the number of centrifuges you have and how many you connect them in series. Sure. So if you have an, you, if you are an inspector of mm. an enrichment plant, then you can see how many centrifuges are hooked up in there. Yeah. Otherwise, you just get normal reactor grade, which is not sufficient for yeah. weapons grade. Well, I remember with the Iran nuclear deal yeah. uh, that uh, Obama negotiated, Trump obviously tore up. Yeah. That there was a proviso in in the in that deal that uh, was the inspectors had to give like 24 hours notice or something yeah. to to our arm before saying hey we're coming tomorrow can you give us a give us a demo pretty much and mm -hmm. gave them enough of a window where they could hide those centrifuges yeah. so there's some really dodgy suspicious stuff in there yeah anyway another one is making plutonium mm. and when you make plutonium you get the uranium to absorb a neutron so you get plutonium 240 mm. and to make it from uh, weapons grade plutonium you need to enrich that plutonium to 24% from 0.7% so that's two you know two metals that you use yeah. to get the fissile material for a reactor mm. now we think about dirty bombs so yeah. what do you do with the waste nuclear material from nuclear power plants and then hooking up explosives and yeah. causing mayhem with it yeah pretty much so according to the u.s nuclear Re regulatory commission mm. it's basically combining a conventional explosive such as dynamite with radioactive material now it's not the same as uh, a nuclear bomb right yeah. so it's not like the movies where you see you know guys in trucks or vans yeah where in the back of the van there's like there's like a react there's a little, a little mini reactor mini much. reactor hooked up with c4 uh, so it's it's only meant to cause uh contamination cause anxiety okay so the bomb will explode it will spread consider like i guess relative to a nuclear bomb it was it'll spread out million times less amount of radiation compared okay. to a bomb so sure. it only affect a few blocks and miles versus thousands of square miles sure so not as destructive but from the sounds of it still a problem still a problem you got a problem of cleaning it up you've got a problem of quarantine yeah you know similar to i guess you know bio attack it yeah. causes stress and contamination but it's relatively controllable okay and you get the material from either hospitals research facilities industry yeah. or construction do they how, how many how many how many do we have stats on how many dirty bombs have actually been deployed i haven't thought about that hey i'll put it into the interlude yeah fair enough cool i'll mm. need to knit that down yeah maybe, maybe do work <laughs> how many dirty bombs? well that well johnny that's why you asked me here to mm -hmm. ask you the hard questions yeah so what's the bottom line just because we're going to use a nuclear power plant doesn't mean we're going to create a bomb right now in helen calderwell's book she talks mm. about security guards how that there's deficiencies in security protecting mm. the power plants but i want to differentiate between mm. the theory and the science versus mm. how it's generally 
applied. The, the public, or the, is it the public perception or how it works in practice? Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, because you're putting humans in a loop, right? Yeah. There was always due to, say, human failure or lack of management oversights or of governance. Course. Yeah. So, well, example is, say, quarantine of COVID, right? Yeah. So people say quarantine doesn't work because all there's all these breaches. But yeah. then when you, there's actually a quarantine inquiry right now in Victoria. Yes. Like the, the hotel, yeah, the barco. Uh, yeah. And people getting raked over the coals over that tomorrow. And, and that one is like, well, you had unprepared security guards. So you yeah. had, you know, guys who didn't know what they were doing or they were just, you know, fighting for whatever information, doing whatever online training is available. Be yeah. They had to find for themselves, not because of the company that's able to provide for you. Mm. You think that, you know, the company hires, it signs up for the contract that they will prepare these people yeah. for, for the job they're doing. For, for the yeah. job. Well, that any government contractor that's usually the expectation yeah so yeah. so let's let's make sure it's not mm. uh, we mix up the government failure and the, and the policy failure versus the theory yeah and the science sure gotcha any questions so far no i don't think so no cool no. all right so moving on to i guess accidents mm. so there's there's a few ex accidents that happened in the last century as well as uh this century yeah uh three mile island but uh we won't go into that one i think we want to hit the big two which is chernobyl mm. and fukushima yeah so what happened in chernobyl so you had soviet you had like lack like of regulation and then there was also uh lack of testing and licensing they didn't yeah. have all these regulations say compared to what the americans did and mm. even then it was a, a learning process yeah and they were also con you know pushing the boundaries of what was considered legal and yeah. within the design so what one of the things that they found out from the design was the using um using concrete and graphite and there was a, a lot of cost cutting uh, measures taken with engineering these the defense barriers yeah and therefore when we reduce the amount of uh, engineering safety barriers available it relies on the human and so, you know, what happens? People turn over, people mm -hmm. come in, they're new guys. Yeah. Uh, management oversight, maybe a management wants more power from this yeah. one. The new guy's too junior mm -hmm. to um, say no. Yeah. And then well, what happens? The inexperienced guy, you know, it, it goes out of his skill and out of his control. Pretty much, yeah. Well, very similar to, well, somewhat similar to what we were talking about with our last episode, talking about the dream world. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, what, so, 20, 21 old lady only got 1.5 hours of training yeah. on the morning of the, uh, of of the, the event. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So lack, lack of leadership, lack of training. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, it, it probably, it probably, it, you know, we'll probably, I think from what my understanding of what happened with happened there is it showcases that, that age old argument of how much government regulation should actually be applied and how much should you let the entity or the organization or the industry regulate itself mm. it's that it's that push and pull that tension point yeah well i mean we're talking about the ussr back then so yes who knows what kind of oversight and cost-cutting measures exactly there, there is a lot of can-do attitudes and a lot yeah. of uh yeah well at the end of pushing the, the boundaries at the end of the day the government's job is to deliver the product at the cheapest price yep so that's that's their goal not necessarily well, not the cheapest but more value for money yeah, yeah actually no that is actually a, that's that's much more fair um yeah, so that's that's the goal. When, that's the perspective the government will always look at, look at it, but not necessarily the private sector. They will look at it and go, okay, we can invest X amount of money, but we can try and make sure that our product is actually a bit safer. Yeah. So, so or, or essentially, isn't going to detonate in our face. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I had the time to do similar what we do with Dreamworld and mm. actually dissect all the the cheese slices, yeah, that led to the accident, um, I would say it's more of a I guess to put a short story is uh, it's a safety culture issue with mm -hmm. Chernobyl using unqualified and experienced uh, people mm -hmm. as well as the balance of safety versus operations and productivity mm -hmm. is it's not there and, yeah. it's, and there's also a lot of inexperienced first responders so you see a lot mm -hmm. of uh, firefighters going into Chernobyl to put out a fire and then yeah. getting radiation sickness mm -hmm. what sort of preparation PPE yeah they didn't really know, but they yeah. know it's, good. it's pretty dangerous. Have, have you seen the Foxtel uh, TV series Chernobyl? No, no. Uh, it, it, go, it goes it goes into pretty much the horror, the stuff that yeah. happened with it. Um, pretty intense stuff. Yep. Uh, what's the other one? The other one is Fukushima, so Japan. Um, so we're talking about it was relatively relatively safe until you had that massive tsunami, mm. and 
they haven't updated the tsunami countermeasure design since the 1960s and right. since uh, there is since there is a lot of technology development since 1960s to then the to early 2000s you, you need to um, update you uh, update your defense barriers mm. and they actually I think I think it was either a week or before the actual event it was just by chance that the engineers flagged this concern about tsunami mm. the tsunami countermeasures aren't up to date with the Fukushima power plant yeah in terms of deaths now in terms of deaths it was 2259 deaths all relating well related to evacuation and they were all age 66 and above and uh, some of the stuff was medical care so once you try to move a patient away from uh, the hospital then you need to have all that continuous care trauma mm. shock moving in uh moving away from from home as well as the stress with you know new environment and unstable environment so you know you, you had the accident yes it did occur but we're not talking about you know nuclear bombs blowing up yeah and causing all this mayhem yeah well you still can't go to chernobyl like the, the no. city they, they built a had a concrete, concrete coffin dome, pretty much and put on top of it yeah outside of the dome right so you've got the dome and you keep branching out that land that environment is irradiated mm -hmm. so i think looking at these nightmare scenarios if you could call it that these are uh, the the scenarios of when it goes wrong i think if you, i think it's in, it's probably interesting to try and compare and contrast if those parameters or if those this scenario were applied to a solar power station or wind or even or even a coal fire power station yep would the would the impact would the outcome be as disastrous i think that's an interesting question no to one's done the analysis yet and we haven't had a pure yeah i guess we have solar farms and wind turbine farms mm. but we didn't have like a concentrated amount of of those um yeah those equipment yeah. out in the open mm. and we haven't well, had an probably, it probably it is is not probably a fair experiment to run but let's say uh with the fukushima is it fukushima is that am i saying it correctly yeah. yeah fukushima with that particular power plant it it was damaged by a tsunami mm -hmm. so what happens if you damage a coal, let's say coal fire power station with a tsunami or a solar power station with with a tsunami yeah what's the outcome is the outcome what are uh, on the same scale caliber than what would happen if something went wrong with a nuclear power power plant yeah i think that's an interesting again you're right like we haven't done we haven't asked that sort of question before mm -hmm. i don't think at least no we haven't had a pure 24 hour operating solar power plant or 24 hour operating wind turbine farm yeah so that's i'm, I'm, I'm aware, so i am aware that the like replicating let's take this this the scenario of a, of this what would the word be the the situation of a the situation or circumstances surrounding the operation of a nuclear power plant and apply it to essentially a wind turbine which is giant giant fan pretty much mm. like it's not equitable but i think that there's some, an interesting inquiry there to try and figure out hang on when things go wrong what's the outcome what's the well the fallout essentially yeah very uh, no pun intended but the point is made mm. yeah we, we, don't, we don't hear about this mm. all right so what's the other one the other concern about waste so yeah. the pollution is about talk about primary nuclear waste and it's high doses and low doses of radiation so high doses dose that will lead to fatal fatality mm. so what's high dose or high level um high level is spent fuel primarily it needs a long-term permanent storage solution you shouldn't be exposed to it but the other thing is it's also future fuel mm. so a reduced amount of mining because you already have it in a known location yeah a warehouse or a storage uh, facility and remember it's only uh, enriched about two percent sure. of the actual uranium ball itself yeah sure the potential for it essentially so you can and still again, continuously enrich that okay or turn or use that for let's say plutonium yeah so it's an so essentially it's a never-ending power source well or, or to a certain extent we've only got since the 1950s we've mm. only used about two percent of those um uranium 235 okay so that ball of the, of of, the world supply or? No, no no of that say because it, it gets turned into little balls and, yeah and then puts into a, a cylinder yeah and that forms the reactor okay so those balls once they're spent from the reactor yeah. only two percent of that re of that 
uranium ball right, is I spent. You. Okay, I got so ninety eight percent is still sitting use, there. It's still usable. So you and can, still stored. And so you store it. You can then pull it back out of storage and use it again. Well, once the technology has come about, right, you, you can use that as future fuel. Okay, so I it's not you. just waste. I gotcha. Yeah, and, and it's not green goo as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think. So, so hang on. So if I dunk my pet turtle in there, or the fish, the three eyeball fish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like no, I'm gonna dunk my turtle in there. And suddenly it'll be a pizza eating, skateboard skating ninja. No. Obviously. So basically, you know. We see that the green glowing toxic goo. We see yeah. like a Simpsons. Oh yeah, it's it's not that. It's basically stored into a dry casket. Yeah, it's it's a a ball pretty yeah. much. Um, so we're just saying it's nuclear bowling balls. Mm. How big are they? Out of curiosity, uh, I believe the size of a coke can. I think there you go. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, so water water can be the reaction because sure. we immerse uh, these uh, uranium pellets or balls yeah. uh, cylinders into water the body to cause it to be exposed to another neutron to mm. split the atom so you have the reactor water mm. which would usually turn into a tritium the other one is also the coolant water yeah so to cool down the reactor but yeah. the, the, the coolant water is fine mm. it just needs to be expelled somewhere it's just it's just hot water sure tritium well, is uh, so it needs to be exposed somewhere again e expelled somewhere expelled somewhere where uh usually back in the ocean okay is there any uh negative repercussions of sending... no no so, so the more concerning one is tritium okay sure sure so tritium is what happens when the water is exposed to the, the nuclear reactor yeah and then it heats it up or it takes away the neutron away from the atom hang on i need to i think i do talk about it later on yeah. because so tritium is h3 so h3o so it's one pr in in the water molecule yeah. the hydrogen atom has one proton and two neutrons that's right as opposed to h1 which mm. is one proton one. one neutron gotcha so with h3 h3 is the one that's uh concerning okay however it doesn't penetrate the skin it doesn't really travel far in the air the, the, in terms of the radiation yeah it can have some impact but it's more like releasing um uh, it can have some impact but i'll talk about that one later because i do talk about tritium levels and all that kind of stuff sure uh the enrichment process the yeah. enrichment pr process can also produce some waste materials so we add chemicals to the uranium oxide ore to turn into uranium hexafluoride yeah. to which is the gas which yeah. turns which enters a centrifuge and turns and we sort out the isotopes in its gaseous form but it's yeah. uranium-235 and uranium-238 so the waste product of mm -hmm. uranium oxide and hydrofluoric acid is the uf4 so mm -hmm. uranium hexafluoride and two hto so two lots of water mo molecules yeah. the extracted fluorine uh gets recycled and we recycle it as HF gas. Um, any of the waste uranium, we can either turn into uranium-238. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's talked about depleted, that's what we talk about depleted uranium. It's yeah. depleted of uranium-235. Gotcha. And it's military applications, the penetrators on saber rounds, shields, mm -hmm. um, so you can use create armor. Okay. Because it's a very dense metal. Sure. Uh, the other one of application is radio radiography to shielding. Now, the other one is also old reactors so there's talk there's concerns about these 1950s technology and yeah i think it might not be fair because we're not talking about the maintenance that's involved sure. the upgrades so they're not as per 1950s yeah it's always ongoing yeah and again an interesting argument here that are the reactors being kept up to a uh, good safety spec it's got more regulation than we ever had. if we're going to have a conversation about should we start using nuclear the first conversation is can we actually upgrade the power station so that they are not going to be 1950s era they're going to be 20 uh 2020 era essentially 21st up bring it up to spec with the 21st century so, with the technology we have available so, so there are technologies out there so mm. there's there's quite old technologies in terms of basically miniaturizing the reactor yeah we put in submarines and nuclear carriers subs, nuclear powered submarines but it yeah. requires a higher enrichment level mm. and that's the more the security concern mm. because it can turn to a bomb yeah the other one is um there was a thing from 2002 about next generation reactors okay. so they talk about 
gas cooled uh, instead of water cooled, uh, and also using high temperature, critical water cooled, sodium cooled, lead cooled, or molten salt mm. reactors. So you can go onto the the website. I'll provide a link, mm. and some of them will use uranium two three eight. So we don't okay. need to use the enrichment process. Mm. Some just use the, the the actual raw ore, so the uranium oxide. Yeah. Um, so essentially, there's some, there's, there are some new technologies, new unexplored technologies, yeah, on the table to potentially make new, the, make the use of nuclear a little bit more safer. Yeah, and then yeah. it'll produce electricity. Yeah, as well as hydrogen. Okay. So the hydrogen can also be used as another fuel. Mm. You know, hydrogen fuel, hydrogen fuel cells. Yeah. To this day, there has never been a dirty bomb explosion. However, there were two incidents in Chechnya. The first was when separatists took cesium-137 and wrapped in explosives and buried it in a park in Moscow. The second was when they hit a bomb in a railway line. In both incidents, the bomb never exploded. From the new scientist in 2004, the risk of dirty bombs comes from the smuggled radioactive materials from laboratories, hospitals and industries. The actual fissile material smuggled has been reducing since 1994. I think what is interesting to me is the amount of bad publicity nuclear is getting. Some of the accusations, such as the consumption of fossil fuels for nuclear power and the environmental impact, can also be applied to renewables. How can we have an honest discussion when we scrutinize one technology over another? And now, back to the show. concept called energy return on investment mm. so the energy is basically a ratio mm. that's the energy out versus the energy you put in and nuclear can vary from 15 to 150 depends on the assumptions and the age of the reactor okay uh, so there's a German Wikipedia site and uh, we'll start from the very top so nuclear was generally from 75 to 106 energy return on investment sure we would just go on to uh, fossil fuels so brown coal uh, and also natural gas can vary from 3 to 31 uh, hydropower has a return investment on 50 uh, solar thermal power is return of energy on 20 energy re return energy investment on 21 right. uh, wind is about 16 to 51 mm. and then photovoltaics solar panels about 4 mm or seven mm. so the highest value is the best value and yeah. it's generally within hydropower or nuclear power yeah and then there's also the uh, amortization period so think about it as a home loan how long does it take to return that yeah. energy investment so but for nuclear and uh, nuclear is two two months uh, hydro is about one year uh, coal can vary from days to months wind energy can vary from four months to one and a half 1.2 years mm. and solar panels are the highest at three and six years right so basically renewable energies not as high ratio yeah. performance base and takes a very long time to get your energy back mm. this taps into my original point i made that our question for nu for, for nuclear is that the efficiency of it how efficient is it compared to other technologies we have on the table? And based off this data, one of the most efficient, if not the most efficient. Yeah. So there's a there's a paper by Wise back in et al. in 2013. Yeah. 
energy intensities, energy re- energy return on investments, and energy payback times mm. of electricity generating power plants. And what it did was we talk about energy ratios, the return on investment ratios, but we don't talk about what does it mean uh, for society as you build them. So human capital is cost money, yeah, and then also the energy consumption as well. Mm. So they create this threshold which accounts for human labor. GDP as well as energy consumption and solar panels pretty much do not cross that threshold. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll go into a quick overview of the process of nuclear power. So, mining it requires uranium, and then according to the World Nuclear Association, 2019, what are the countries that actually have the world's uranium? So it's Kazakhstan at 43 percent. Canada at thirteen percent and Australia with twelve percent. There we go. So we have a lot of uranium here. Mm. We don't have a nuclear power plant. <laughs> that seems pretty stupid. I oh, know. <laughs> it's limited resource. So you know, Helen Caldicott says, you know, the the high grade uranium ores are finite. Global high grade reserves amount to three point five million tons. Given that the current use of uranium is about sixty seven thousand tons per year, these reserves would supply fifty more years of nuclear power at current production levels. Okay, but we, 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 we talked about this stuff. Remember, we talked about future fuel. Yeah, so that you've got that. If you apply the R and D research, there's a potential that you could take the the waste, ball. the waste, the ball, the ball of nuclear the uranium, uranium yep. ball, yep. and start tapping into the remaining ninety eight percent. Yeah, uh, we also have these uh, next generation reactors, which we more efficient and more, uh, and it can produce electricity and hydrogen. Yeah. So there's some stuff that needs to be updated here. Mm. Now she talks about the complex process of milling and mining. So she says the the rock itself must be excavated by bulldozers and shovels, and then transported by a truck to the milling plants. Sure. All these ma- machines use diesel oil. Yeah. Furthermore, the maintenance shops that service these equipment consume electricity, hence fuel oils. Mm. The uranium bearing rock is then ground to a powder in electrically powered mills. The power is treated with chemicals, usually sulfuric acid. Then several other chemicals are used to co- convert the uranium to a compound called yellow cake. Now, here's where I get a little bit annoyed because it's not just uranium that it gets this treatment. It's yeah. other rare earth metals. Yeah, I was just thinking that because I, solar power, the solar panels that collect the solar radiation that can then be able to convert to energy, that entire process needs rare earth metals as part of the manufacturing manufacture process of those panels. Yeah. So last time I checked, you need to mine that from somewhere. Which uses trucks, which, which uses, uses trucks, excavators. Also, also, it's a finite resource. So again, yeah. her, another argument dispelled of, hang on, if it's a finite resource, we shouldn't do it. Hey, energy production is tapping into finite resources. Yeah. Like that's just a fact of life. So. Yeah. I don't think it's fair to throw the feet of nuclear and go, here are all the faults, but we'd go with the renewables, they've got the same faults going at the same time. Yeah. It's intellectual dishonesty at that point. Yeah. So the enrichment process, we talk about that one, which is, you know, the reactors uses 235, uranium 235, mm. which only uses 0.2%, and we need to increase that percentage enrichment process. So we add hydrogen fluoride to turn it to HF6 gas, uranium H hexafluoride put in the centrifuge and let the heavy atoms go to the outside the uranium 238 while the lighter ones go on the inside or uranium inside and then we feed that next the, the gas to the next stage so we get more and more concentrations of uranium 235 we talked about the actual nucleus inspectors earlier on yeah yep, so you can actually determine whether it's the enrichment plant is uh, is what used for making bombs or just reactor grade uh, uranium now the deconversion you just add water and hydrogen and turn it back into oxide and hydrogen fluoride which can be recycled or stored and we talked about shaping into pellets or balls and storing into rods to form the reactor so what is the next stage the next stage is we take that reactor and we put it and we try to get to create the fission process so uranium-235 is stable on its own but when hit with a neutron, it turns to the uranium-236, which is unstable. So to hit it with a neutron, what does it mean? It just means submerge it in a body, okay. which is water or graphite. Okay. 
which is one of the funny things because Chernobyl they yeah. use the reactor rod, the control rods was also graphite, yeah. which is a body. So they have that control measure to stop the fission process. Mm. You use graphite. Yeah, I remember from this is this is a scene from the from the series, the Foxtel series, and uh, one interesting thing there was they were saying we we were using the latest technology of the time. Like, our, our scientists, our experts told us that this would be okay. We're following the manual. So, yeah. So, what anyway. Do you, what do you happen with Uranium-236? It splits into Barium-141 and Krypton-92. Hang on, Krypton. I've heard of that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I, I, one, one fond memory I have in science class is looking at the periodic table and going, hang on, they've called one of the elements Krypton. That's fun. That's, that's <laughs> Superman to the <laughs> So once you split an atom, energy is also released, and then yeah. three other neutrons are released. And what do those neutrons do? They bump into other uranium two three five molecule, so uh, uranium two three five atoms, and then they cause that chain reaction. Right. Uh, so what's the waste? We talk about the waste product, which is uranium two three eight. Um, that can be used either for shielding or future fuels. Or uh, we can also use the uranium two three eight to turn into plutonium-239 just by adding the extra neutron. It turns into, is it neptunium-239? And then later on, plutonium-239 after adding an anti-neutrino. All right, so we talk, okay, so here's a bit about the water reactant. It's a tritium, is one protons, it's a hydrogen atom with one proton, two neutrons. Funny enough, you know those luminescent watches mm. that glow yeah. in the dark yeah those are used tr for tr tr tritium okay so it's some people just carry it right next to them okay then uh well, if you ingest it, it doesn't do much if your skin can block the radiation from tritium yeah and there's not much science with regulating the tritium levels in drinking water okay and in fact fish are more exposed to it than the sea than nuclear power plants there you go but i wouldn't i don't know about actually fishing in the re nuclear yeah. power plant though. Don't mind me, I'm just standing at the top of the basin. I'm just going to fish yeah. <laughs> straight into the nuclear power plant. Yeah, all right. What's the worst going to happen? So here is specialists in energy, nuclear and environmental sciences. Oh, sorry, on the table on tritium drinking water standards. Yeah. And then funnily enough, what do we have at the lowest? I believe is actually America. Yeah. At 0.04 MSV. I think that's also how out of de um, atoms that decay in the water. Okay. Australia is the highest. Hmm. I don't understand that. Yeah. So maybe it's because we have a lot of uranium. Uranium in the earth. Yeah. Yeah. And then they did a calculation. So if you had 20 BQL mm. um, in your drinking water, it would be, you, you convert that to exposure to cancer and there'll be about uh what is it one times 10 to the minus six lifetime risk of cancer okay that's assuming so that very life yeah that's assuming that your life uh yeah. average lifespan is about 75 yeah. years yeah so there's no real so this particular element this particular part of the reacting process reacting process very low risk yeah. sure oh i'll find it out so there's a large body of evidence which demonstrates that the linear no threshold model for risk estimation is flawed and yet radiation protection regulation Markedly deviates from proven science. Once again, it was concluded that regulating tritium levels in drinking water to 20 BQ per liter is not only a poor use of resources, but introduces many other problematic issues associated with the implementation and monitoring of compliance with the new regulation. There's no hard science on tritium water. Yeah. Cool. All right, we talked about the coolant water and we also talked about the storage issue. Funnily enough, it's actually more of a government issue yeah. because the nuclear industries, the, the private companies yeah. which do this, there was a deal made with the government, in, with the US government, to for the government to develop that permanent storage solution. Okay. But there's, since there's none yet developed, yeah. it, it falls back on the companies. To actually to store, store the stuff. And yeah. then it's just end up with, you know, when we close down a power plant, that we have, we, we can't use 100% of that land back. This is isolated shed. Yeah of uh, waste nuclear where we can't products. do it we can't touch it yeah yeah so again let's separate the science from actual practice sure let's be fair to both sides yeah 
I'll talk about also the emissions during the whole process. So the milling and treatment should be treated no different from other sources of rare earth materials. So this is where we'll talk about being fair with, say, solar and wind, if you're going to do the same thing with nuclear. Yeah. So neodymium is used in wind turbines and cell phones and GPS, as well as electric cars. And there was a disaster in 2012 in China when it leaked out all this acid into the lake mm. in, uh, in Inner Mongolia. Um, that acid we talked about we were treating the ores that was just discharged into the lake right so that can also be an issue yeah copper is also used in rare earth materials uh, for other uh, storage devices mm. and that uses sulfuric acid uh, lithium we extract lithium from brine reservoirs or salt flats and they also be treated with sulfuric acid now cobalt is an interesting one because that's also used in, in lithium ion batteries yeah and there was a little article in the, about the Democratic of Republic of Congo where they had child labor mine these things. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of we we open up mining and there's a that can of worms. There's a massive. There's a host of ethical problems and not a web of questions we need it's, to answer. It's not isolated to nuclear. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think also you would use child labor for nuclear for uranium plants. I for you for uranium mining. Yeah. I, I I don't know, yeah. but. No, well, the, it's the, messy the, the yeah the, that is messy the point i was making uh, was that you open up that can of worms of mining in general not just nuclear but any form of mining yeah and there's a web of unethical and ethically questionable things that are questions that need to be answered so it's not again it's not something that i don't think should be thrown from what the information we're talking about i don't think it's fair to throw that at the feet of nuclear and say nuclear bad mm. so you know, what does Helen, Dr. Helen Caldicott say in her last chapter, which is renewable energy, the answer. Mm. So she writes, the good news is that there is no need to build new nuclear power plants to provide for the projected energy need of the future. Indeed, it will be possible using other forms of electricity, using other forms of electricity generation to close down most of the existing nuclear reactors within a decade. Okay. There's enough wind between the Rocky Mountains and the Mississippi River alone to supply three times the amount of electricity America needs. Now, okay, funny so enough, she, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't talk about the lithium issues. She doesn't talk about the mining issues and the, the acid. Basically, renewables are here to save us from all these uh, problems. We don't talk about the environmental waste it generates, yeah. but it feels good to have wind turbines and solar panels. Cause oh, yeah. Because we see that thing and it's like, okay, it's not doing it. It's not polluting anything. I can see it. Yeah. Whereas I, I see the, the two chimneys from a nuclear power yes. plant. So, what, but what, that's water. That's yeah. not radiation or smoke. That's, that's interesting. I didn't I didn't know that. There you go. I was went, oh, the dirty nuclear power plant over there spewing stuff into the nice, clean nice clean sky. Well, it's just, it, just water. Yeah. You, you're immersing that uh, uranium into the water. Of course. It turns into steam, it turns into turbine. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the interesting thing is that it's, it, I think we've established that so we're dealing with a classic case here of intellectual inconsistency. The issue at hand here is that with Dr. Helen Cartercott, my, my natural assumption when, is that when you write a book about nuclear energy, nuclear power, nuclear energy, any form of energy, you're an expert in the field. That's my, that was my assumption going in. You said she was a pediatrician. Yeah. Completely different field. Completely different. Mm -hmm. Right? So, but we're dealing with a case here of intellectual inconsistency where her argument is by the title of her book it's already you already can tell the direction she her argument and she's making she's, she's making an argument like there's something she obviously believes in she's making an argument a, a case a building case the problem is is the case has the case and the argument that she's you creating has a number of intellectual flaws and that's the problem that well for this i think we're getting with this conversation is we're finding hey there's a lot of flaws and misconceptions about nuclear energy things that i didn't even know yeah that we're finding throughout this little journey of ours. So, you know, just because you put wind turbines in the middle of this, you know, rocky mountains, yeah. there's nothing to lose in the mountains. Are you sure? Because they occupy the wind channel mm. and there's a lot of biomatter that builds up on wind, wind turbines, which need to be surfaced and maintained. Yeah. Why is that? Because you have insects, you have bugs, you have the rare bird wildlife. And we're, not, we're not talking about sparrows, we're talking about eagles and, yeah. you know, hawks. Uh, the other one is, you know, solar, fa solar farms, mm. and they put out in the middle of the desert. Yeah. But just because there's nothing in it, so just because it's in the desert means, doesn't mean that nothing lives there. Yeah. So there's a bit there's of a... There's a complex ecosystem yeah, in every single bi uh, 
uh, environment. So there was like uh, a story which I think Michael Schellenberger was talking yeah. about, which is you had these few hundred year old tortoises living yeah. in a desert, yeah. which they had to relocate to clear it to, to, right. to move to, to create <laughs> these solar farms. And and, I, they, and, they, and then these tortoises just move into little cages and zoos oh or whatever. Gosh. I don't know if it was zoos, but in his conservation sites and just die. Oh gosh. And I, and I remember, I can remember reading stories of here are the top 10 uh, nuclear and coal fire power, power stations that have been built. And all here's a list of all the animals that have been made extinct or died or had to be relocated. Like massive lists and going, oh. it's happening across the board. It's not a fossil fuel issue and renewable good yeah yeah you it's happening across the board you had to clear massive amounts of land yeah just for that. and yeah. same as with like say biofuels and ethanol yeah. like you build sugarcane yeah. farms you had to clear massive amounts of forest area so to do it, it. at the end of the day it sounds like we're trying to solve problems with renewables but re the issue at hand is that renewables are causing maybe oh, either similar problems or different problems well it's less efficient yeah and and and, and goes to the efficiency question of they're not as efficient yeah so why so why are we pouring all this time into something a that is not a fit as efficient as what we've got and b is causing is not solving key problems with the current technology yeah i i, I might save that for another episode but mm. you know with uh with, with all this renewable stuff What's about the disposal and uh, the closing down these other places? So yeah. what happens to the composite materials mm. of wind turbines? Yeah. What happens to the heavy metals that's embedded in your solar panels? They're fair questions. Do we just throw them away? Yeah. Or where are they going to sit in a river and leak out, you know, cobalt? Well, we built, well, we build a shed next to the shed that already houses the nuclear uh, balls, the yeah. uranium balls, and we just build more sheds. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, uh, titan sheds will be over the moon when we pitch that suggestion to parliament yeah. so you know, you know what you know let's be fair if we're going to have an honest discussion and, and you know when the title of the book is nuclear is not the answer yeah. it's like i'm i don't think you're being fair of anything yeah. are we going to take away point here or not yet not yet i might end it off with uh, yeah. australian nuclear so yeah, sure. you know we in australia have 30 percent of the world's uranium deposits and we sell it over to, overseas to Japan, South Korea, China, UK, France, Germany, Spain, Sweden, and US. We also sell it to nuclear weapon states like China, France, and India. So that's a concern. Uh, so, you know, how, how come we're not nuclear, even though we have a lot of the world's uranium? So we actually signed a part of the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1973. And then you had a lot of, um, say, the france doing their nuclear testing in the pacific and that sort of caused a little uh, backlash with the public and then we also signed up with the 1998 nuclear test ban so we don't develop any more wnds we're part of the treaty of rarotonga so we'll make sure that the pacific is nuclear free and there was a royal commission in the nuclear fuel cycle and storage in south australia but that never that didn't really support the nuclear fuels uh, idea we did consider it back in 1950s and 60s, but it failed, and it led to all these, uh, all these treaties being developed that restrict us from developing nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and nuclear power plants. Uh, we were home to the British when they did nuclear weapons testing here, though. But in Australia, there's only three nuclear research reactors. One is now remaining. And so I guess the reason why we're not nuclear, why Australia's not nuclear, is that there's a lot of lack of political will to pursue nuclear energy when low-cost coal and natural gas is abundant in australia you can you can check out some of the websites and you can see that we're mostly using coal uh, some of us use hydro and some of us use wind in different states but coal is the main uh, fuel for australia's power generation oh and don't forget uh, elon musk's uh, batteries yeah. in victoria um, south australia has the largest amounts of uh, wind uh, wind turbine but also has the highest amount of retail electricity prices in the states i don't know i, I can't say it's definitely a causal relationship but um it's a fairly split debate in australia about renewables yeah so i guess my thoughts are you know there's a lot of emotion fear with, between nuclear power uh, the same level of scrutiny isn't given to its competitors in renewable uh, the waste, the disposal, the acid treatments. 
nuclear power isn't really a seriously considered source. And the question, I guess, is, you know, we have the world's, one of the world's largest deposits in uranium. How come we're not using it? And we preach clean energy, but we're still reliant on coal. All right. So, so I, guess, I guess what's changed since you've, we discussed this? Well, I've probably learned more about what what's involved behind the scenes. When someone says nuclear power, what does that actually mean? Like, there's stuff that I didn't know when sitting down, going through some of these facts, going through some of these details. And I'm not I'm not a scientist. I've got I haven't I haven't got a science background. But there's information here. It's not. I would say it's not enough to convince me. Say to alleviate all my questions or concerns that I started, that I've always been, we've always been talking about. But I think that one key takeaway here is that there's an, there's an important question here of what do we do with fossil fuels? How do we create the energy that we need to continue our society? Those, those are important questions. Uh, where do we, and where do we need to go with that? Obviously, we've got a debate forming between fossil fuels and renewable energy, but... I think a key takeaway here is that we need to be intellectually consistent when we're conversing on this really important topic. And when we try and tackle these problems, I don't think that engaging in one-sided or slanted arguments are that throw all of these faults and flaws and failings at the feet of coal-fired power stations and nuclear reactors and then, and then conveniently ignoring them when it comes down to solar and wind primarily having the same problems or causing the same problems that's not intellectually consist intellectually consistent i think that's a really big problem there so yeah if we're going to have this conversation we need to have it on an even on an even platform mm -hmm. and weigh and weigh up the pros and cons of these different very different technologies fairly and evenly and then we can hope, hopefully come to a solution where we're all going yes this is the best solution going forwards yeah so, I mean, but that's the idealist in me. The book was interesting, and it was also good to see the opposition view. But mm. you know, for a doctor, you know, I would think you know, if you write a book, you try to be fair. And it's like high school, right? Yeah, high school, you say write both sides of the argument. Yeah, and the way up at the end. Yeah, and the, you know, if or, you had ninety eight percent of your book bashing nuclear, or at least make your case without glaringly ob like in this conversation, we've poked holes in the arguments that have been presented. Yeah. If you're going to spend, if you're obviously, this is a person who is, I would, I would assume, D is very passionate about what, about the, about her position, and also believes her position as well. But if you're going to make your argument, make your argument that so it doesn't have these glaring holes that can get poked through. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's also, uh, you know, her position is might might be reflective of general anti-nuclear people I, I i could say it's a fair it's a, it there's a fair argument there yeah so I mean, she's one of the leading parts. she's one of the leading activists right against yeah. nuclear power yeah well well again i think that we've <laughs> we've we've crushed we've not crushed the wrong word we've poked through a num wait <gasps> we'll wait for the kookaburras sorry we almost yeah 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 no it's an interesting wrapping up conversation we, we've we've discussed and I, I think we've somewhat fairly validate, fairly evaluated her arguments, and gone. Well, here's the argument. Here's the fact. Here's here's the scientific facts. And we've gone. Do these do these way up? Actually, we've found that there's holes in them, mm -hmm. so they're not good arguments. Okay, let's go back. Go back to the group and go. Okay, these arguments didn't work. Do you have Do you have better arguments? Yeah. Can you convince us? Like, yeah. I think I think one good thing with our conversation is that we do want to figure out what the best answer is we're, we're inquisitive we want to know and if we're th if we if our current position is wrong or incorrect we let it let us know we can we can have that discussion have that and, and have that debate yeah but i think one of my thoughts after going through some of this and also going for the opposition is that you know we can preach renewable but i don't think we can make the opposition happy like there was you know that land clearing has to occur somewhere yeah and oh, you're right. And, yeah. and I think that not in my backyard um, idea. We don't. We want to have a that hundred percent ideal we power want, plant. We well, we well, what deep at the heart of the issues. We want our electricity. We want our phones. We want our Xboxes. We want our cars. We want all the stuff that makes makes our lives what they are. We're not willing to pay for. But it. We don't want to pay for it. Yeah. There's a cost to that, 
And I think that one interesting thing from the facts that we've gone through, the research, is that, yes, there are, prob- there are loads of problems with fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. Absolutely undeniable that. But there are just as many, if not, and very similar problems with renewable energy. Yeah. But the key difference between the two, renewable energy can't, can't match the output, the uh, effectiveness of fossil fuels. And nuclear. And, and nuclear. And, and hydro. You, you are correct, yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Anyway, interesting conversation, Johnny. I think we'll end off with it there. Yeah. Sounds good. I think from today's episode, it's clear that we can't apply a clear black and white view or good versus bad technology when we compare nuclear versus renewables. The activist argument against nuclear can also be applied to renewable technologies such as toxic waste, wildlife and environmental impact, consumption of fossil fuels during mining and processing. So where is the honest discussion that allows us to choose the best selection of technologies to give us the energy we need? The other problem is the actual return on investment. Why are we so focused on developing these low efficiency technologies that are intermittent? Even with battery storage solutions, it requires a huge upfront cost that is not guaranteed to give 24 hour power supply. It's why Australia still remains reliant on black or brown coal fire plants. The irony is that Australia sits on the third largest uranium deposit and exports it to other nuclear countries and those countries that are also not part of the non-nuclear proliferation treaty ensures that they do not develop more nuclear weapons. If the scenario proposed by the doomsday scientists and climate activists picture the world in environmental apocalypse, and that is just around the corner, shouldn't we choose the lesser of two evils? How is it logical to solely invest in low efficient renewable technologies that also hurt environment and is not giving us the power we need? I think that the risk analysis and the cost benefit is skewed. When you write a book titled, Nuclear is not the answer, with a concluding chapter saying renewable is the answer, you're not presenting an honest argument. Let the reader decide and also apply the same critiques to both technologies. While Dr. Caldecott's book appears sophisticated, it is not totally honest. I think it's also a reflection of what is going on in the minds of radical environmentalists who are picky with their energy and are simplistic with their analysis. They are also not willing to pay the high price they want to enshrine in law and by the taxpayer. So if you want to get serious about looking after the environment, then whilst nuclear is not the perfect answer, it has to be one of the many answers. You can reach us at thefireinadesert at gmail.com or Twitter at fireinadesert. Music is at Fox in the Fox by Ken McLeod at www.incontech.com. Thank you for listening to The Fire in the Desert, conversations about life, culture and society.